God bless you, God bless you. I'm Reverend Dr. K.E. Holmes. You're at the Hour of Deliverance. And I want to ask you and commend you to email somebody, text somebody. We're going to go to a place in the Word today that sounds easy, but is a problem in the body of Christ. And mostly among those of us who love the Lord with all our heart. Those of us who are so dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in the last days, and um, there's just a problem that's that's galloping away within the body of Christ, and it is costly. And so, email somebody, text somebody, and uh, let's get into it. Now, I'm going to call it "Be Thankful," and and I want you to see that uh, while it, it's I come from a generation where it's popular for preachers to fuss, and I want to show you that uh, when God doesn't like a thing, he lets you know about it. And it doesn't feel good to be reproved. But he who has an ear and he who is wise will receive reproof. And that's why I want to call it be thankful so that it doesn't feel hard if I if I say some things that mm, you find that that's you, uh, not just you as the victim because we can always recognize when we're the victim, but when it's us doing it. And I want to warn you of something, that uh, usually the thing that you recognize and the thing that you see, uh, that's you. That's you at some stage, at some way. That's you. Uh, how is it someone made the expression, uh, there, but for the grace of God, there go I? And they got that really from the, the scriptures because it tells you about snatching souls from the fire. It says with fear and trembling. And it lets you know because that could be you. That could be you. And what I want you to know, usually this time of year, I do a uh, webinar or a course on living your purpose at the speed of life. And one of them is knowing who you are, knowing how you are. And this is... Uh, to use a phrase from a book, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because we, even redeemed, we have ways. When you look at the, the apostles, each one had their own very significant personality, and I know the ones that stand out are Peter, James, John, uh, John's brother, uh, but we have our ways, and they're not, I'm not talking about things that are unholy. But anything that's not yielded to the Lord, it's unholy. And as saints of God, none of us are just galloping away trying to be unholy. But who was God talking to when he said, be ye holy, for I am holy? He was talking to his people. Why would he have to talk to us if we have it down? Why would he have to keep telling us? And he does. And it's because we don't recognize ourselves when we're moving away from the way of the Lord Jesus Christ, from the way of the cross, and mostly from the way of the resurrection. Because we know we're supposed to live a resurrected life. And if I'm talking Greek to some of you, 
then I promise you all you need to do is accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior right now. Just say, Lord God, Jesus, I receive you. I recognize you as Lord. Be Lord of my life. I know that you died for my sins, and I know that you raised from the dead. I believe you. I trust you. I give myself to you. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Change me. Save me. And fill me with the Holy Ghost. Lead me and guide me in all truth. Now, if you did that and, and you confess the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, confess the Lord Jesus. And I'm not talking about trying to fake anybody out or trying to get to a fast solution to a bad problem. Because most of you are going through some bad problems right now. And I said bad like that because that's how they are. They kind of freeze you. And you know that you're no wimp. The wimps have already flaked out. They've already fallen. They're already doing crazy stuff. You're the one who helps the people walk right. And yet you know that things are bad. And that, that's not a surprise. Remember Moses standing before the Red Sea? And uh, the people were crying to him. And they're standing at the Red Sea. And Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But the very next verse that's him before the people. Stand still. That's you before the people. You know the scripture. You know what to say. You know what to do. But oh my goodness. When it's you or when you get home, like, Lord, what am I supposed to do? Lord, what am I going to do? And with Moses, you see where he says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord over in Exodus. The very next verse, God says to him, why are you crying to me? He didn't say, why did you ask me? He didn't say, why did you declare? He said, why are you crying to me? Because in leadership, we know what to say to the people and we bring it and it's not fake, but we're still shaken sometimes because we don't know what the next step is in the face of the Red Sea. And we need to grow up and understand that most of the victories that we have, most of the glories that we have, they were through some harrowing things. You have a testimony because you decided to mo not to moan when you could have moaned. And some of you did moan all the way through the test. But then God brought you out and now you've got a testimony. And I know that's a play on words. I said it that way so that you'd remember. So that we'd understand that in the bad circumstance, God said, we know that the 23rd Psalm. He said, I'll prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And most of the time when we're going through, we're so busy dealing with the enemies that we don't recognize that God's got us. He has us and he's brought us through. That's why we have that footprints in the sand uh, picture and poem. Because when we're going through, it feels like oh, you're crying out to God. You told the people the right thing. You gave them the word. You're trained in the word. You're steeped in the word. So you said the word. But you don't see it happening. Why? Because the sea hasn't parted yet. You, brought, you went to where God said to go to. Abram did that. He went to where God said and then he didn't see anything happening. And most of us, it's kind of like Abram. We have to do what God said. You know, God told Abram, leave your father's house. And God has told you things. And he's given it to you. And you know that he spoke to you. You know that he laid a thing in your heart. Or some of you did it because you know that it just jumped out at you in God's word and it burned in your heart. You see, some hear the Lord and some sense the Lord and some know by faith his will. It says in uh, the faith chapter, through faith we understand. Not through intellect, but through faith we understand. So some of you have the revelation of God on what to do, how to do. And, and it is put in your heart, or he spoke to you, or he did it in a dream, or the word burned in your heart and leaped at you so that you know. But then when you go carry it out, it's not quite as easy as you expected and as you thought. That's just like Moses getting to the Red Sea. He did everything God said. And we read the story knowing the victory, but think about living it out. You do what God said and the people are mad at you. Come on, pastors, you want to do what God said and, and tell them to follow the vision, take them through all the courses so that they know how. You tell them what to do and then they're mad at you. And that is what happens in leadership. And, and then you start to wonder when it keeps on happening, did God call me the pastor? Listen, you're in good company. That's the way it was with Moses the whole way. 
Uh, and most of you don't have a million people complaining at you every day all the time when it just, just doesn't go their way. And that's not even including the people that have a legitimate complaint that something's wrong and you need to fix it because you've got all this other coming on. But what you want to know is this is why you want to stay in the Word so that you can continually give thanks no matter what's going on. See, that's why God told us that in everything give thanks. One scripture says for everything gives thanks, but another one says in everything give thanks. And most of us who know to give thanks, we want to park on the one in everything give thanks because you got sense enough to thank God no matter what the circumstance is. But uh, most of you that are really going through, you don't want to thank God for that. You don't want to thank God for that. But God said, he said both. He said them in two different places, in two different contexts. And I want you to know both contexts refer to me. They refer to you with whatever you're going through. So I want to look at this. Uh, Joseph. That's not where I want to go right now, but Joseph. He was not thanking God when he was down in the pit when his brothers wanted to kill him. He wasn't saying, oh, thank God. God, I bless you for this trial. I bless you and I thank you that my brothers are trying to kill me. The thing about that is, now, that, that is kind of ridiculous in the sense of when you're going through. However, if you always keep your eye on the Lord, you'll recognize that every victory comes through a trial. Peter walked on water. In the middle of a storm. And don't ever ask how bad can it be. You know this is as bad as it gets. It was a storm. And they were scared almost to death. Because they thought Jesus was a ghost. So it's bad enough. But see we keep reading. But understand that you need to keep on living. Just like they had to live through this circumstance. Right then it's a storm. It's bad enough. They don't know where Jesus is. He's not here. And, and there's this storm that can capsize us. We're doing all we know. It's bad. That's why I said it like that. Most of you, what you're going through is bad. It's bad like that. Now living it. Now we keep reading and we know just in, you know, next few verses, everything's okay. And you need to know when you're living it. The next few verses, everything's okay. It's okay right now. Why? Because God is faithful and God is good. We're going to look at this. Be thankful. Amen. To, I want to look at an unassuming thing to remind us to be thankful. And I'm talking to us as people that love the Lord Jesus Christ, as people that are seeking righteousness, not fence straddlers, people who love the Lord and are solid in that. And that doesn't mean that you're without fault, though. You know what? You could be. 
It doesn't mean that you're not perfect, but you know what? You could be. Even before the cross, people had a testimony of God that they were perfect. Come on, look at Job. Go, go look at God's testimony with Job. And I dare you, <laughs> yes I do, I dare you to have that kind of testimony with God, that that's what God has to say with you. Look at the testimony with Noah. And there's some historical things in the mixing of the Neptun and all that, but being perfect in your generations, let that be you. And that if people could do that before the cross, certainly after the resurrection, filled with the Holy Ghost, you can certainly do it. So we need to get rid of these false doctrines about nobody's perfect. The, one of the reasons, not the whole reason, the, the main reason that Jesus walked, Jesus came as a man is so that he could pay for our sins. But why he walked on this earth three, three years as a man is so you and I as human would know how to do it and know that it is, is to be done. You're not an anomaly. You're not sprouting wings to go to heaven when you walk up right before the Lord. So now Remember that there are trials. Please remember, we have these scriptures memorized, but living them is when we need to have them so steeped in us so that we don't flake and so that we're not the ugly one and so that we're not the one that he has to rebuke. And if he does rebuke us, that we still hear and don't rebel and don't find reason for all of our ways. When God let me know something, uh, I, I I had to say, looking at the fasting chapter, and most of you began the year fasting, but looking at the fasting chapter, God rebukes them so strongly. And and ah, and I said, God, I don't know anybody. Anybody fasting is seeking you. And, and yes, you're seeking the Lord. And then he says, not like that, you're not. I mean, ah. So I want you to see, always give thanks and always be thankful. And even for the circumstance and the situation, I want you to see here that, that God, the scripture that we love to quote, that um, for God, uh, he causes all things to work together. As a matter of fact, all, all things, it says, I believe it says, for we know that all things work together for them that love God and the called according to his purpose. It doesn't just start as a statement standing alone when you're going through stuff you feel like you're standing alone it starts as a for we know and there's a reason that we know and it's just things that went before i'm not teaching that right now if i go there I'll, I'll teach it but i want you to look at genesis 49 just some things to know that living life living the trials and living with people of god i'm talking about the people of god never mind the heathen and, and I mean, never mind the heathens. Stop paying attention to everything that the heathens doing and the heathens done wrong. The word of God says of my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray. God talked to us. We're the ones that are the standard for the land. If things are going wrong in the land, it's usually because we didn't stand like we were supposed to. Most of the time, we're busy fussing and arguing with one another, fighting one another, or we have our focus so that we're about the things of the world rather than the things of the earth. And that's why all through the, the scriptures, especially, look at the New Testament. He's talking to us to not be entangled again. He's talking to us when he says, don't fornicate. Don't even let it be named among you. He is talking to us, not the heathen. You expect a dog to bark. Woof. You expect a cat to meow. Meow, meow. It's not strange. So, uh, 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 heathen? They're going to do what heathens do. It's strange when we don't walk right. It's strange when we don't want to be unified with one another. But, oh, if it's me, I have my reason because they shouldn't have done this. And he did that. And I'll, I'll never darken the door of that church and blah, blah, blah. Instead of, Father, you're bringing us into the unity of the faith. That's what you said that Jesus is doing. And I'm, I am in this world even as he I commit myself to be his. So I'm going to show you living the circumstances with the saints. And I'm saying because those who had the promise looked ahead to the cross. So I'm going to show you from an, uh, just an unassuming place in Genesis 49, going through Jacob blessing his sons. And I say blessing, I want to put it in quotes because we find out when we get to Levitical law way later. 
way later, you know, uh, when we get to Moses, we find out when the Levitical law is given, God is God. He He is saying, "You don't do this." And then when we get to the New Testament, it says, "Bless and curse not." And the blessing of the Father is supposed to be just that. Not just know what your kid is like and know what your son is like, but bless. Bring out the king in him. You know, when I talk Song of Solomon, if, uh, I usually give uh, the Song of Solomon course at least once in a year, and usually around Valentine, so that, now I call it, by the way, SOS, help my hormones are coming. SOS stands for Song of Solomon, but it also is a distress call. Because in there we see that, ah, there are things going on and and we need the Lord present and he's present because it's like first Peter what is it uh first Peter yeah first Peter 1 22 it says seeing you purified your souls see to it that you love um, one another with a pure heart fervently so that you have to already have made these commitments before the Lord Jesus told us that the first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart your soul your mind and your strength and in case we think we've got that down, he said the second one is like it. Love your brother even as yourself. So there's things that God has commanded and a father does some things. God's already made a command. We're not talking about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about the commands that when God ordered the earth. And one of them is how a father is to do. And, and a father is always to bless and not to curse. Now, because fathers don't do that all the time, we have the New Testament scripture that lets us know that a father can discourage to a point that the kids don't walk the word. So the the, the acknowledgement is given to the fathers um, not to do that. So here we're looking at Jacob. Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Now, this was a time of blessing. He thought he was leaving here, and he went to bless them. So gather yourselves together, and hear ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Now, I want to... to I'm going fast, so I'm not going to take the time to connect all the dots. I know that I'm talking to people that already know the word. So I want to remind you that here again, we're talking about people of God. They have a call on their lives and, and not just for their own selves, but for whole generations. We're reading it so that we can see it, know it, and recognize it. You know it because you understand that God has called you. If, and if you don't know that he hasn't called you into some kind of ministry, if somebody's looking and say, well, that's not me. No, he called you to glory and virtue. Check out your New Testament. He has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Okay, so he's called you. You are the called. You are the chosen. Even if you don't know of a specific ministry or part in the kingdom that you are, you are part of the body of Christ. So if you're not an arm that's readily seen or eyes that readily see, you might be the heart that nobody sees, but you keep the rhythm going. You might be the, 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 the artery that, that, pumps the blood one way or the vein that pumps the blood the other way. You might be the little toe that helps keep the balance. You might be the liver that's not seen, but anybody without their liver dies. Nobody. You, the scripture lets you know if you're the comely parts, you get, you're get supposed to get more honor. But look at this. He says, gather yourselves and hear. So understand, these are the people that are called of God. And I want you to understand, I'm talking about giving thanks even though you're among the people that are called of God. And when we're among each other, sometimes things are going on with us that don't look like any kind of call of God. So Reuben, thou art my firstborn. Okay, the firstborn is the strength. The, the first, Well, let me read it to you, actually. Uh, Genesis 49.3. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my, my, my might. And that's what the firstborn is supposed to be. The beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. That is what he is. That is who he is. And a father declaring it helps him to stand in all of those things. When you know what your child is called to. You know, the scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart. When God as a parent has given you as a parent, even if you're out of wedlock and it happen all kinds of crazy ways, parenthood, God automatically ordains of you that you know what is for your child. Now, you might be going through stuff, uh, might be too young and all that kind of stuff that you don't know. 
My grandmother had her first child at 12 years old. She wasn't trying to get pregnant either, by the way. And she used to say she didn't know how she got pregnant <laughs> because nobody told them the birds and the bees. I'm sorry, I have to laugh at that. Sometimes I'll share it with you. But um, yes, called of God. Called of God. And I will let me I'll write this one down. Men of excellence, people of excellence, usually, usually can also walk something very other than. How would you like to have met David, man after God's own heart? The word says so, so that you know it's so. How would you have liked to have met him during that year and a half, two year period where he's messing around with Bathsheba? Not only messing around with her, it wasn't just a once and done deal. It kept on going on and then got other people involved asking other people to help him sin and set it up for him and and he was the king so they better not do something different than what he said and then had a man set up uh, a man's murder set up if you met him during that time there is no way that you would understand unless god himself told you that this is a man after god's own heart and that's what i want you to see here the people of god called of god you need to make up your mind now that you readily pardon you forgive as jesus christ forgave you because we can be some we can be something other, look like we're living something other than called, but it's not our being. It's not who God has made you. It's what you're doing. And we need the two to line up. So Reuben, he says all these wonderful things. And as a father, he should have left it there so that the man could just walk that right. Because not just the man, but then the whole tribe begins to walk out what the father has pronounced. Do you know that about your child? You're so busy being a parent. Do you realize that what you speak over your child, you're speaking over everybody with whom they have to do and how they transmit and transfer what God has given them, their purpose? I told you this is a time of year that I sign up for the course where I do living your purpose according to the speed of life. Because life doesn't wait for you to get to get, get it together. This is how it happens. So look at what he says. Unstable as water. That is not what you want in your firstborn. Unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel. This father pronounced that on his, on his son. This man of God pronounced this. This called of God. This appointed of God man appo uh, said this. Pronounced this on his son. He could have left it as what his virtues were and let God take care of what his faults were. And that's why we, I'm letting you know that when we get over into Levitical law, God lets you know that, you know, you guard your tongue and you, you don't just speak ill of a man and you don't just tell a thing just because it can be told. I know that we've just lived through times where we call it keeping it real, telling stuff. Well, the word tells you that you don't need to tell anything unless it ministers grace to the hearers. Unless it's causing somebody to walk in a way that is right. Not just know something because you call it the truth. You don't even know the whole truth. Every, every ill that happens, you don't know what God is doing in the thing. Just to catch you up on something, I'm interrupting myself. Yes, I am. Jacob here, he causes um, Joseph to swear. Uh, this might not be the place, but he when he has uh, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh come before him, he causes Joseph to swear, now his favorite son, to swear on his life that he won't leave his bones there. Why? Because he left his mama. And he needed, his. he knew his son would do anything he wanted. He didn't have to have him swear. But he had done something that looked like it was a wrong that couldn't be made right. But God made it right. I don't want to go through the prophecies with you now. You've got to sign up for the course to do that. But, but God made that thing right. Rachel died on the way from one place, getting to another place. And he let her, he buried her right there. He didn't stop what he was doing. Go back and bury at the place of promise that God had done or the place of promise that they're on the way to. He buried her just right, just dropped her bones right there. The person that he loved. I'm talking about people of God doing things that don't make any kind of sense and that we know better than. But that's what he did. So when it came time to tell his son, Joseph, who would do anything that his father asked, he made sure that he swore on his life that he would bear, not leave his bones there. Why? Because he said, like I did your mom. Like I did to your mom. People of God. But we've got to give thanks through all of these things and not park on the faults. Amen. We're going to come back to this. You give thanks no matter what.
Okay, we're looking at this, giving thanks. Not just giving thanks in all things, but also giving thanks for all things. Why? So that you don't curse something all the way out to generations all the way through the earth. Like, And I'm showing you here that Jacob did this. You're a man of God. You're a woman of God. God has called you. Even if you're not the head of a mega church or even if you can't see, like J Jacob knew that he had an inheritance, but he didn't see it the way we can see it. And he understood what fathers are to do. He had an exemplary father and an exemplary grandfather. And yet as a father, he cursed his son. I'm letting you know, parents, you... And psychology tells you that. I don't know why we want to believe psychology over believing the word. But, you know, believe and don't curse your children. Even if they are. Even if you can see that they're unstable as water. And, and that on their own, they're not going to excel. God had called him out. God had called him out. And as of yet, there wasn't a Gideon for him to understand that you can be a, you can even be a coward. Now, Reuben wasn't a coward, but you can even be a coward. And, <clears throat> and God will call you out and he'll use you and he'll cause the enemy to be afraid with you because God, he hadn't spoken this to word that we know of yet at this point, but it's still his commandment that I will prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. So God will be God in you. He'll be God for you. Don't you remember with Abraham, with Abraham, pardon me, he was Abram at the time. See, some of you, you're not all that at the time and God will still be God. God is always going to be God. He has no problem being God in you, through you, and for you. So remember Abraham, he had lied twice. Twice. Oh, wonderful man of God. Now, I, I know those of you who are used to me, you know that I've told you this before. Somebody that calls yourself a prophet, if you know that you caught them in a lie and they lied on this and they lied on that, you don't want them to pray anything for you. And yet, when you look at it, Abimelech, when he understood that Abram lied to him, and not only just lied, but the lie was costing him the nation. You read that thing carefully. The whole time that Sarah's in, in his court and part of his harem, and, and come on, grow up. I'm going to really tell you something that you don't want to know. <laughs> when you're part of the harem, it means that the king can have sex with you when he feels like it. And he hadn't gotten around to it. <laughs> um, I have to laugh because years ago, I made a little round thing that looks like an egg. And had it uh, cut that way and printed on it, round, R-O-U-N-D, dash two, T-W-T-O, dash it. And I would hand it out to people. Stop saying when I get around to it, I'll do this and I'll do that. Here, you got your round to it. So when he got his round to it, uh, he was going to have her. But he just, he was busy. But that's the whole reason why he took her. Because he wanted to have her. And he wanted to have her without being married. And maybe we'll get married because she was that gorgeous and that beautiful. And maybe she's that king, uh, queenly and stately. Well, when he was considering it, you know the story. God let him know you're a dead man. And he's like, whoa, what'd I do? What'd I do? Most of us don't even want to think that God talks to people that, that don't know him personally. Well, here's one of the places in scripture where you need to get off these false doctrines because they make you believe some other things that aren't true so that you act in other ways that aren't Christ. But getting back to this. So God tells Abram. Now, now God, I mean, pardon me. God tells Abimelech, he's my prophet. While he's recognizing that not only did he lie to him, but he's costing him a whole nation. He's caught, nobody could get pregnant while Sarah's in his harem. That means a nation will die in a generation if no babies are being born. You don't need an army to come in and take you. Just don't produce. And God says, he's my prophet. Now, most of us, we don't want a prophet to have anything to do with him. Abimelech wanted to kick him out. But God says to him, have him pray for you. And when Abram prayed for, you, for him, then the curse came off. And he blessed him. Most of us, if somebody does us wrong like that, we want to kick him out, don't want to see anything and have anything. We need the mind of God. You need to give thanks. When you give thanks, you'll be able to hear God when he tells you, bless that one that cursed you, that caused you to come under a curse. We always think it's the enemy in the sense of someone who's fighting with you. And it can be that too. And we always think the enemy is, now that was a play on words. We all, uh, 
Sometimes we think, most of the time, we think the one fighting with us is our enemy. Listen, husbands and wives, you fight, and you know you're not enemies. Now, some of you don't know it, and so you go ahead and go get these divorces, and that should have should teach you, because God is the one, and he was talking to Moses when he said it, the meekest man, most teachable man. He said, I gave divorce for the hardness of your heart, because you're not hearing one another. So... I'm talking about men and women of God. Give thanks. And it puts us in the place where we can readily pardon. Why? Because there's things that need to be pardoned, for sure. And and Simeon and Levi are brethren, instruments of cruelty. The father's recognizing what his kids are like. These are some cruel folk when they're together. Are, are in their habitations. Listen. You know what your children are like, but you don't need to tell everybody. You talk to God about your children because he also called them men and women of God. And I'm talking to men and women of God because you are a legacy, living, living a legacy, especially if you have children. But even those of you who don't, God has called people to and given you people. Like Jesus said, I haven't lost any that you've given to me. Every one of us are giving people that we're to bring to Jesus Christ, that we're to nurture in the word and the ways of the Lord. We are a kingdom. We are a royal priesthood. And that is what priesthood does. We teach. You don't have to be called a teacher. You are already called of God a royal priesthood. And priests teach the ways of the Lord. In the various nuances and circumstances that we live. And so give thanks. Without giving thanks we end up giving grumble. Grumble, grumble. And God told us over in Hebrews that that complaining thing is an evil heart of unbelief. I'm telling you, nobody, nobody who is God's people is trying to have an evil heart on purpose. But understand from God and from the word of God that he said, you can't even enter into your promise. You know you have promises of God. Some of you are going through diseases and you know that God promised you and, and yet the disease isn't leaving. You know you have a promise of God. Are you grumbling and complaining? He told you in Hebrews that the children of Israel did not enter into their promise. I promised them. God is letting you know. You're not mistaken. I promised. But he said they didn't enter into the promise. Because they complained and they grumbled. And he calls that an evil heart of unbelief. When God says something, you want to believe him. You know that he promised you. Then believe him. No matter what the test is. No matter what the trial. And the way that you do that is you continually give thanks. And, and I know that I've shared it with you before, but I'll share it with you again. When the, when the scripture says thanks, it is... To the, our Western mind and our modern mind, we think it's thankfulness and gratitude. That is included, yes. But in the emphasis in the word, when you give thanks, it's gratefulness. And the thing about grateful, if you do an exercise right now, when I'm doing counseling, I have people do this exercise. I'm going to do it quick with you now. But think on something that you're just so so grateful about, uh, whether it's your kids or or what's something that you are just so 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 grateful notice that when you think of it it makes you smile notice that it causes you to breathe it gives it causes you to feel something and it's a lift why what is that it breath is life gratefulness ministers life god is life and when you are grateful it lifts you not just thanks, has sense enough to say, thank you, God bless you, I appreciate it. That's part of it when the scripture says being thanks, but the emphasis on the grateful. Grateful causes the breath of life. So you that's why God told us to not just be thankful in a circumstance, but be thankful for. Because then the mind of God, you begin to be able to see, like Joseph saw on the tail end of the situation, that it wasn't... It wasn't you. God had his purpose. He didn't see it when he was in the pit. But he didn't grumble against his brothers. He didn't grumble. So here. 
uh, parents, as, as I'm going through this, I'm showing you several things. Why? Because God has given us a mind to be able to see more than one thing at a time. He's got more than one thing at a time in this word. He's got the main point. He gave you the fingers to be able to understand that when there's a thumb, there's going to be the pinky, the index, and the other fingers. The, the, it's all going to be there, not just one thing. You're able to uh, understand and comprehend many things at one time. You are fearfully and wonderfully made so that you can receive all of these different things, whether it's the Father, bless your children and establish the blessing and let God deal with the mess that you know that they are at times or that the thing that you knew that they did. Um, he says, oh, my soul, come not unto their secret. He knew that they had a secret. You know this about your kids. There's some things now. My children are wonderful. And I'm not just saying that because of what I'm giving to you. God has, has said things about them and done things through them. And ah, it boggles my mind. It's wonderful. And yet they have things about him. I know their secret. They don't talk, want to talk to mom about it. And it says, unto their assembly, mine honor. Now, if you're going to just concentrate on you, you're not going to be grateful. You need to keep your concentration on the Lord, man of God, woman of God, because this is man of God blessing his children. This is the call of God blessing his children, but he's also bringing up the curse. And so the curse is going to keep coming up in the generations and God will deal with it. But God would have dealt with it without the father having pronounced it and causing it to stand. Ah, So he says, O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, my honor, and be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man. They did. They actually, men of God, men of God, what are you doing killing somebody, setting them up like that? And, and of course, they didn't mean to. And I don't mean that they didn't mean to kill him. They set up a situation and they thought they'd say something else. And when they didn't, they still carried out their plan. Did you hear me when I told you earlier that most of us who are righteous and holy before the Lord, we're only looking to be righteous and holy. We didn't mean for it to turn out the way it did. We didn't mean for a such and such to go such and such a way. If you stay grateful, you will have the life of God the breath of God and the mind of God so that you will carry things out in a very different way than if your attention is all on you and what God called you to do. And I'm only talking about people of God, men of God, women of God, the anointed, the appointed, the called, the elect. That's all I'm talking about. And yet all this crazy stuff goes on. So stay thankful no matter what. Even when they do, when we do these horrible, horrible things. So I, I know some people are so mad at me, they can't think straight when I'm around. You need to forgive me, whatever it is. I, I publicly ask your forgiveness right now. And that's if you think I did it on purpose or if you think I didn't. No, we pardon according to the way Jesus Christ forgave us. He doesn't say, ah, well, they did that on purpose. I think I'm going to, nah, can't forgive that. No. Or, oh, they didn't mean it, but oh, it hurt like they did. You know, if somebody steps on your toe, it hurts, and they didn't mean it. It hurts the same whether they meant it or whether they didn't. Readily pardon. And pardon like he gave you. None of this, um, uh, what is that expression that was uh, familiar some years ago? Well, I, 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 I'll, I'll love him, but I don't like him. Can you imagine Jesus saying that about any of you? I'll forgive him because I love him, but I don't like him. No, God doesn't like sin, but he loves you and he likes you. You know how you know this? One, There's several ways, but one I'll tell you right now. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you know, so that not only would you not perish, but Jesus says, no man comes unto the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father, but by me. You know that only people, the people that you like are the people, people you invite home. Jesus likes you. The Father likes you. He doesn't just love you. He likes you. And we need to have the mind and the heart of God so that we're not coming up with that crazy statement. I like, I love him, but I don't like him. You need to find what God likes. Have the mind of God. You don't want God saying that about you. I love him, but I don't like him. No. He sees his son when he looks at you.
Amen. We're going to finish this. Be thankful. Be thankful in your circumstances. And I'm talking about your circumstances where if you don't keep your eyes on Jesus, you won't even know how to be thankful. You will find yourself complaining and grumbling just like the children of Israel did. And God is not playing about this. We're the ones who are responsible to know. If you find yourself uh, always pointing out the wrong, and, and I... <laughs> If you find yourself always identifying, it's not that you're not supposed to know. But if you see it, you're supposed to, you're made in God's image. You're supposed to be like El Roy, God who sees. When God sees, he made provision. He made provision. You're supposed to be like God in these circumstances and situations. And... You're supposed to demonstrate what God does. I wrote a poem, God Speaks Well of His Children. It's part of the I Am's that I do uh, <laughs> on another course. and Or also, you, you hear them. I do the I Am's when we come on the broadcast and when we leave the broadcast. And those aren't just affirmations. Those affirm. Those aren't just confessions. They affirm who you are because God said so. And that's why you can live so. That's why you want to be able to give thanks. Not just because everything is hunky-dory and just the way you love it, just the way you like it. But because God, He blesses in the midst of all awful circumstances. He brings you through. He makes you as pure gold when you weren't pure gold. So don't lament your own faults. Lament before the Lord, but stand up. If you're not the personality and the person that you would like to be, ask God for wisdom. Ask Him to change you. I guarantee He's doing it in you. But if you keep your eyes on Him and give thanks, you'll be like James and John. The scripture said that they were sons of thunder. And, and the first act that they wanted to commit against somebody, and like most of us who love the Lord, we think we're all correct about what we think and feel, especially when we feel fierce about it. But if it's going to cause a war... If it's going to make us want to take a life. No. No. Understand already that we're the one who's not right. And we're the one called of his name who need to repent. Turn from our wicked way. God calls it wickedness. He's talking to us. And guess what? God heals the land that you were blaming everybody else for. You know, they, they won't take care of, of the uh, energy problem. They won't take care of the, uh, uh, the melting that's happening. 
you know, the climate problem, they won't take care of. No. You'll find that God who sees, you're made in his image. He's given you to be someone who makes a difference in it. One example I'll give you, and I'll be like Paul and say, uh, um, there, was a, there was a person. But there's some things in our country that, that are wonderful now that didn't, weren't so just 40 years ago. When, when uh, 40 years ago, having a prison ministry was writing the people in prison. People didn't go. And they, they didn't want you in the prisons either. They didn't want me. They didn't want you. They, the, all over the nation, they said that it costs more because the people act up. They're emotional. They're this, they're that. It takes more guards. There's just a problem. That was the, the thought 40 years ago. And then there was a person, that, that more than one I'm sure, but I can tell you of a person that God had said to go into the prisons. And very like, you, you know, when something's not the way it is, not the political way, not the way anywhere in the nation, uh, they, they said no. And there was a situation where, uh, and God knows how these things are orchestrated all at one time. He knows what he's doing. You don't. He knows his mind. We don't. And in this situation, there was a situation with the mayor. And there was a situation with the governor and uh, another political person. And, and the uh, head of the, the warden, the head of the prison in that area. And the, the situation happened that uh, that that person was busy dealing with prostitutes, bringing them to the Lord, and some officials showed up <laughs> as customers, and next thing you know, that person was offered to come into the prison. Nobody said anything, and obviously it was so that they keep their mouth shut, or maybe it was so that they uh, let it go, let it, you know, let it go by. At the same time, what was going on, that uh, there were political enemies happening and they found out that this person wanted that and in order to stick it to one of the friends <laughs> they decided to allow this thing now they didn't think it would stick but because of it today you're able to go into the prison as a ministry you're able to have a real prison ministry and not just what it was called 40 years ago uh, when you somebody wrote the letters and stayed in touch with those who were in prison. And even then it was usually the men and not the women. The women were forgotten because women were hardly ever sent to prison. And their children were forgotten. And now because of, of that one person, and their name isn't on this, that oh, prison ministries are now happening all over, all over the world, all over the United States because of so-and-so. No. It's because someone was giving thanks while they were going through some really tough, ugly stuff. When it was bad. And it was, it was very bad. But giving thanks in the midst of things. You can be like Joseph. Yeah, your brothers throw you in a pit. You give thanks. If you're one of the ones that, that the brothers are mad at talking to and chewing out. Give thanks. And let God bring you out. If you're like Jeremiah, you did what God said, and the king is against you and throws you in prison. Know that God is doing what he said. He's taking care of you. Jeremiah didn't know it, but the siege was going so bad for the people of Israel. While he's in prison being fed uh, prison water, you know, bread and water every day, that's just barely enough to keep alive you were given in prison. But the people outside were dying of starvation. They weren't getting enough to barely keep alive. He didn't know as he was going through it, Jeremiah I'm talking about. He didn't know that the Lord was keeping him. The Lord was doing exactly what he said. Whatever it is that you're going through, and you know that you have a promise from God, know that God is faithful and that he keeps his promises. He promised you. He said, will he not do it? I'm letting you know he is doing it. And give thanks. It gives you life. It gives you the mind of God so that you can see it the way God said. So that you have your eyes not on the storm and the sickness and the pain. 
but you have your eyes on the glory that is set before you. And I'm not talking about going to glory. Yes, that's going to be glorious and it's going to be wonderful. But that's not even how you think when you think about that. You think about stopping this, the situation, the pain, the trial, instead of believing God and reaching to the promise. You're not thinking about going to glory. You're not thinking of the wonders of glory, the streets of gold. You're not thinking that you're going to see the Father's face. You know that, but that's not what you're thinking. You're thinking you want to end the trial. Well, it's God who gives life and it's God who ordains the trial. The trial is so that you are more precious because you are more precious than gold. And it is to try you, to make you so that you stand, so that you're glorious. So that when you read the book of Revelation and see what he gives to the overcomer at the end of every one of the ch uh, seven churches of Asia, there's a promise to the overcomer. Well, if you choose not to overcome, you don't have the promise. If you choose to grumble and complain, you don't even get to enter into the promise. And if you cause people, if you cause God's people to not see God, if you let yourself, like Moses did on the second time when he was supposed to speak to the rock and bring out the water, but instead he rebuked and he he spoke uh, pardon me he hit the rock rather than speak speak and it cost him it's why he didn't go into the promised land if you stay in thankfulness you will have your promise you will see it and you will live it and you will establish it for your time for your generations for your city for your town for your nation instead of decrying the ills of your time and times of your trial of your nation be thankful be grateful it's life it ministers life know that you be that you do that you cause that in Jesus name amen you are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God. God has blessed the work of your hands and you walk in favor with God and man. You think from the word and you make wise moves. You are blessed and excel in all that you do. You always attract people of wisdom and an excellent spirit and you engage in transactions and situations of vast, excellent and lasting merit. You are occupied with people and endeavors on a plane of timely, immediate, high and positive return in the internal, the external, and the eternal realm, in the temporal, the celestial, the natural, the spiritual, in the personal, interpersonal, community, national, and global. You move in all that pertains to life and godliness, according to the promises of God in all of their fullness. You are continuously and profoundly supplied in time, resources, wisdom, and health, in favor and finance, and all manner of wealth, in revelation and vision of things present and things to come, in the knowledge and understanding and zeal of the Holy One. You are called to His glory, His virtue, and His praise. You are elected to His power, His loving kindness, and His grace. You are clothed with humility, and you are prudent in matters. You are blessed and anointed, highly favored and appointed, and you are full of the Word of God and its demonstration. God has appointed your going out and your coming in. He has ordained that your very life exemplify Him. Righteousness, justice, and holiness unto the Lord is the mark of your call. And the resurrection power and the glory of God, you will fulfill all. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God.